let us just start. I think everyone who is going to be here is in fact here. If not, they will take care of themselves. Um, welcome to the August 2020 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems Advisory Panel. Um, I would like, as always, to begin with introductions, which is always such a fascinating thing to do on this technology. Apparently, I've become famous for not being able to do it properly. Sorry, I'll just start. I'm Eitan Ness Redden Longo. I am the chair. And then I'm going down a list I have here. Jessica, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Jessica Brown. Um, on RDAP, I was appointed by the Attorney General um, as a community member at large, uh, and I'm also the supervising attorney of the Public Defender Office in Chittenden County. Thank you. Uh, Chief Stevens, good to hear you. I think you're Hi. muted. Ah. Yep, I'm um, Chief Stevens uh, from the Nolhegan Abenaki tribe. Um, I was also appointed by the Attorney General and um, happy to be with you. Okay. Christopher Loris. Hello. Yeah, I'm right here. Christopher Loris. I am with Crime Research Group, joining Robin, who you'll be introducing in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Susanna Davis, please. Hi, buenas tardes. I'm Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. I am here as an observer. Great. Jeff? I am Jeff Jones, uh, another appointee um, at large. And uh, hi, Julie. I have to say hi to Julie because she used to live across the street since yesterday she moved. Oh. Okay, thanks. Paul Groth, please. Hi, I'm filling in for Rebecca Turner. I work at the uh, Defender General in Franklin County as a public defender. Thank you. Representative Lalonde? Lalonde. Uh, yes, um, Martin Lalonde from South Burlington, and I'm uh, joining just as an observer today. Thanks. Thank Kristen McClure. Hi, I'm Krista McClure. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the state, and I'm listening in today. Thanks for having me. Pepper? Hi, uh, James Pepper with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you. Jeff Pippinger. Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Pippinger. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner for the Governor of Tampa. I'll make my apologies now. I need to get off the call at seven o'clock tonight. Thank you. Ruben Jennings. Hello. Uh, yes, how you doing? I'm Ruben Jennings. I'm with, I'm with the uh, Prisoner's Rights Office and uh, I'm here along with uh, Paul and uh, Jessica. Thank you. Gary Scott. Hello, Gary Scott. I'm a captain with the State Police, Director of Fair and Impartial Policing, and I'm the Department of Public Safety's designee to the panel. Julie Scribner, please. Hi, I'm Julie Scribner, uh, captain with Vermont State Police. I will be uh, attempting to replace Gary when he retires this fall. Thank you. Heather Simons. Hi, Heather Simons from the Department of Corrections. I'm a guest and observer. <clears throat> Great. Stephanie Seguino. Hi there, uh, Stephanie Seguino. I'm on the Racial Equity Advisory Panel and just sitting in tonight. Thanks. Thank you. And then I have someone with the name of unknown user, which tells us you know, I don't even have a phone number for the unknown user. It's probably me, Aton. It's Robin. Robin, hi. Okay. Hi. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Robin Joy. I'm the director of research for Crime Research Group. Thank you. 
Monica, Monica Weber. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I am the Department of Corrections designee to the panel. Great. And then we have 802-505-9147. Nope, that's me. That's Robin. Sorry. Oh, I'm not the end never mind. There's someone else who's a mystery guest. Um, okay. That is everyone I have. Did I forget anyone? If I did, this would be a really good time to introduce yourself. Hey, hey, Tom. Yes. This is Becca. Am I your mystery guest? You may be. Okay. This is uh, Senator Becca Ballant. I'm representing representing uh, Senate leadership, and I'm just listening in. Thank you. Right. Thanks. And okay. it's Sarah, Representative Sarah Coffey joining you all. Thank you. Hi. I sit on House Corrections and I'm li listening in as a guest. Thank you. Great. Anyone else that I don't have on my list and who hasn't introduced themselves? Okay. We move on to the announcements. Um, I should point out that we do not have Judge Grierson this evening. Paul Gross is sitting in, as you know, for Rebecca Turner. Sheila Linton is unable to be here as well, as is Jen Firpo. Julio will be late, as Jeff Pippinger said, he needs to leave early. Um, I do understand that August should be a vacation, but of course, 2020, to say the very least, is not a year like any other. Um, the work on Section 19 of Act 148, the Justice Reinvestment Act, and that section, as I sent to you all, is on data, needs to be considered now, given the resumption of the legislative session, which I don't think I need to characterize for everyone as extraordinary. Um, you're aware there are many legislators who are with us this evening. Um, they clearly want to listen in on our conversation and perhaps certainly participate after the panel's discussion. Um, I understand for the panel, this is not where we've been. You will recall that after our meeting last month, we had decided that we were gonna take another dive at the report, that the report was going to be, we were going to take the recommendations that we came up with and make them more full, I should say, if not indeed fulsome, and in fact, probably come to loggerheads about some of this, and that that was going to be the basis for an addendum for that report. Um, for those of you who are listening in, that is where we have been, and that is where we were going. Um, so that addendum that we were projecting last month, I'm afraid I'm going to have to table because the only person, uh, well, let me not put it that way, one person got back to me with recommendations for the recommendations. So it really doesn't give us much to move on. Um, it doesn't really matter, however, because in fact, what we are doing as the agenda that I sent you makes clear is we are going to talk about data, which as you recall, was a major uh, theme in the report. It was required by Act 54 of 2017 the act that brought the panel into existence. Um, so we're not actually going in a different, different direction. I would suggest that we're getting to where we're going by a slightly different route. We need to discuss this in any event. And we have certainly gotten a request from various legislators to move in this direction right now. So I think it behooves us to do so. Um, I think that's all I need to say about this. And then we move on now without much ado to the discussions. And I'd like to start with Jessica Brown. If there are no questions, I should say, I'm being bad teacher here and just bombing through my lecture notes. Is there anything anyone needs to or like to put in at this moment? My God, this is bizarre. There is no one in my room, but I'm asking questions, I guess, of the rhododendron. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to the next item, which is an update on the search 
for the executive director of the Vermont Police Academy, and also an update on a meeting of the Symposium of Racial Equity Work Groups, which certainly involves this panel, and the person who's going to bring us up to date on that is Jessica Brown. So take it away, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aton. You make it sound much more dramatic than it's going to be. I can't um, help it. <laughs> it should be pretty. It should be pretty brief. Um, so, I'll start with um, the. There is a hiring process going on for the executive director, and I want to get it right, which is why I'm staring at my file. The Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council um, executive director, and. Uh, Aton was contacted uh, as the chair of RDAP to participate on the hiring committee and bring along one other member of the RDAP panel. And he asked me if I would do it. And I said, yes. So uh, he and I, and actually other people on this call, I know Curtis, um, maybe Ingrid and or Gary um, were involved on the committee as well. Uh, those of us who were on the committee uh, interviewed four candidates, and the process is still going on, so I'm not going to name names or identify anybody or, or give uh, disclose details because it's a confidential process, but um, two people were uh, moved forward, and um, I do think I can say that um, there was a real strong consensus um, about one candidate in particular who happens to be a black male, which um, would be, you know, I mean, he was qualified for many, many reasons. Um, and the fact that he is an African-American man, I think, I'll just say for me personally, I think could be a real bonus and a real, um, uh, a real just benefit to our state um, at this point in time. And I will also say that whoever gets the position, I think is really going to be um, open to hearing from a lot of different voices about our interests in um, reform in policing in Vermont. Um, and I don't know if that would be something that our panel would engage in with that person or, you know, there are a lot of other groups that might be more appropriate. Um, but so I think that's really my only update about that. Um, if anyone else on here from that committee has any other details that they think are important to share. Um, like I said, that hiring committee, that was like the first stage and two people were moved forward. Um, and I honestly, I'm not super sure of the timing of the rest of the process for them, but I think it was going to move fairly quickly. Um, so I hope that we'll hear, you know, in the next, in coming weeks or month or two about a decision about that. Um, and I would say that both candidates that got moved forward were, to me, very exciting. So um, if anyone, does anyone else on this call want to add anything about that process? Okay, then the other thing I'll just mention is, um, and I'm going to try to be really precise because Susanna Davis is very precise about what she calls this group. Uh, but it is a symposium of um, racial equity working groups, I guess, is the best way to describe it. And um, it's very informal. Um, it is not an official committee or panel in any way, um, but it is basically an effort to get together people who are on various racial equity groups like RDAP, like um, Fair and Impartial Policing, um, like uh, REAP, which I cannot remember what it fully stands for, but the group Stephanie's from. Um, Bor Yang comes to the meetings from Human Rights Commission. So it's really, like I said, an informal um, effort to have various groups that are working on you know, similar and closely aligned racial equity and justice projects to kind of make sure that, um, or well, to to educate each other about our efforts, to um, make sure that nobody's reinventing the wheel, that we're not yeah. all doing the same thing, that we're not doing duplicative work. Um, but one of the things that came out of our most recent meeting that is relevant to this panel is that um, we 
members of a lot of different groups that were participating in the most recent meeting of the symposium kind of identified uh, Frustration sounds a little too negative, a concern, I guess. I mean, I'm actually going to read from um, some of the minutes really briefly. Uh, members expressed concern and frustration regarding their collective reporting mandates and the sense that their outputs are not utilized effectively. Uh, members consider jointing, jointly drafting an open letter to the legislature on this topic, but would need confirmation from all the respective work groups to take this action. Um, so what we talked about was sort of, um, you know, events since May, really, um, after George, George Floyd was killed in Minnesota, really have uh, spotlighted and highlighted the need to address certain issues around racial equity and justice in Vermont. And the legislature has really shown an interest in addressing some of those issues. And we're going to talk about some of that as we move forward tonight. Um, but there was definitely a feeling among a lot of the representatives of various agencies and committees and panels that were participating in this symposium that, you know, we want to make sure that the work that we've already done, that the reports that we've already submitted to the legislature are being um, considered and, you know, and utilized effectively. Um, so, Certainly, we don't need to do it tonight, but I think a conversation that this group can have probably next month is about whether we want to participate as a panel in any sort of letter addressing those concerns um, or whether, you know, it's not going to be something that we have consensus on and maybe have to do as individuals or, you know, or somehow in conjunction with our, our thoughts about submitting any addendums to our previous report work that we've already submitted to the legislature. Um, Susanna or Eitan, do you have anything to add to that summary? Sounded Sorry. good. All right. Yeah, then I that's all, really that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, Susanna, did I hear you in the background? You did. I was just thanking Jessica for a great summary. I have nothing else to add. OK, thank you. And thank you, Jessica. That was great. Questions, comments? Hey, I have a yes. question. Chief um, Steven. Was, was there any discussions or concerns around the numerous amount of committees that seem to be doing the same work or overlapping? Uh, uh, you know, there, there, we had talked about this in our and in our uh, committee when we were doing our reports is that it seems like there's always a task force created or someone to inquiry about making recommendations or they're you know they pop up and and it's like there's a lot of overlap or or trying to figure out who's responsible for what i was just wondering if there was any concerns about either trying to work together all of us work together or if there's or 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 how do we collaborate um, in order to, so we're not duplicating efforts. Jessica, do you want to take that? Or, oh, Susanna, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, Chief, I'm 100% with you. It, it's really um, startling, I think, the first time that you look at the list and see all the groups that are doing some kind of work around racial equity. And so the, the two meetings that we had in this quote-unquote symposium have touched on the fact that there are so many groups and um, and another group was created between our first meeting and our second meeting, which is the Racial Equity Task Force. And, um, and, and so the short answer is yes, there has been discussion about that. And I think part of it is us working together. And one of the things that I'm really pleased about is that the people who have been coming to these meetings have said, let's do this quarterly so we can stay updated on one another's work and progress so we're not duplicating efforts so we can read each other's reports and lift them up um, appropriately. So yes, one of them is we want to collaborate. And the second thing is that it helps us guide um, and, and keeping in mind that we have um, esteemed reps from from the General Assembly here. I don't want to be um, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I think in some sense, us having a good picture of the landscape of all these groups and working together helps us guide them when they consider creating another group. Um, it makes it easier for us to say, well, actually, we and two other work groups are already doing this work. You may consider some alternate paths 
not to presume to tell them how to do their jobs, but I think it's 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 a way to manage up, so to speak. Okay. Just can I add? Have... Can I add one more thing uh, quickly, just to say this? As I said at the outset, it's a totally informal gathering of people who want to get together to compare what our different groups are doing. So certainly, anyone should should who wants to add another quarterly meeting to their schedule should feel free to come. And uh, I'm sure Susana could give you. The date of our next get together. Great. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Four, three, two, one. Moving on. Um, I did forget one announcement, and this is critical for the panel. You will recall that we are we were talking about basically reintroducing the report given the frustrations that we were feeling around its reception or lack thereof after December 4th of last year. Um, you may recall that Attorney General Donovan was at our last meeting um, and was listening in. He has been able to arrange a press conference for us and also to secure the attendance of Senator Dick Sears. Um, that is going to happen pretty much at our pleasure, honestly. We need to figure out a good date. And to that end, I, yes, I, the person who does not understand how to turn his computer on, is going to come up with what I believe is called a doodle poll. And we will figure out a time because I'm smart and can figure this out. And I will send that around sometime this coming week. I just want you to be aware of that. We're going to try to figure out a time that as many of us as possible can show up. Um, we'll make other determinations when I see how many of us can be there, but that's where I'd like to start. So I just wanted to announce that, um, that that has come to be, come to pass. Uh, moving right along, let's get to Act 148, Justice Reinvestment 2, I guess. Um, uh, and I would like to ask uh, James Pepper to take over because he knows about this and he's been actually working on it and preparing for this. So Pepper, please. OK, um, and uh, I'll just I would like to uh, just start by saying there's a lot of members on this panel that work very closely on this piece of legislation. Um, so I'm certainly not the only one that could speak about it, but I will start out by just kind of giving some background about the bill and then talking specifically about Section 19, which enlists the uh, racial disparities panel, as well as um, uh, some specific stakeholders, including Zuzana Davis and CRG. Um, so uh, just I think uh, this panel will probably remember um, last year we talked about the kind of steady drumbeat in the legislature about uh, eliminating the need for out of state prisons uh, for the Vermont incarcerated population. Um, and that culminated in a call for a tri-branch uh, call, including, you know, key members of the legislature and uh, the governor's office and the chief justice calling for the Council of State Governments to come in and do a deep dive into our prison population and try and uh, formulate strategies um, for uh, reducing the number of our incarcerated population. Um, so CSG, um, Council for State Governments, is a uh, think tank based out of, I think, D.C. and New York, and they offer technical assistance to state governments for these sorts of policy initiatives. They came in to Vermont and worked very closely with a working group um, that included legislators and members of um, the administration um, and members of the judiciary to look at, uh, you know, strategies that might be helpful in reducing our prison population. Their main finding, I think the high level finding that um, gets repeated a lot is that 78% of the sentence corrections, uh, uh, the sentence admissions um, into the prison population are from technical violations. 
violations, uh, either through, these are violations that don't constitute a new crime for people that are on furlough status, parole status, or probation status. And so the idea of justice reinvestment, and this is actually our second time through this process, is to make investments uh, that are targeted at reducing recidivism on the front end, and then using the eventual savings in the corrections budget, budget to you know backstop, backfill that those initial outlay of, of funds. So, uh, so what we have in the justice reinvestment bill that passed Act 148 is a two million dollar investment in programming, in housing, in um, just uh, investments that are targeted at reducing recidivism, and then you also have a number of um, policy initiatives that are targeted at re at uh, creating more due process um, around things like furlough uh, or par parole violations. Um, and so all that's great. And I think, it, you know, there's some real transformative things that we're going to be doing in Vermont that no other state uh, has even contemplated, um, which is pretty exciting, I think. Um, but then there's also this idea that we need to be thinking about what's, what's next. And part of that is um, this Section 19 uh, group, um, stakeholder group, that uh, you know, Aton shared with you the exact legislation. I'm just going to review it quickly with everyone right now. So um, there, the membership of this stakeholder group includes the Racial Disparities Panel, um, and then a bunch of people that are on the Racial Disparities Panel, um, including um, the Chief Superior Judge Brian Grierson, the Attorney General, the Defender General, uh, Department of Corrections, State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, but then also um, the Crime Research Group, um, who's represented here today, and uh, Susanna Davis, the Executive Director of Racial, Racial Equity. So I'm really glad that everyone is here today because I kind of see this as maybe just a preliminary discussion, an initial convening of this group. And so what is the group supposed to do? Um, and I'll just kind of give my own version of it, but you, you all have the language. Um, we are we're supposed to look at all of the existing data points that we collect throughout the criminal justice system that explore the relationship between demographic factors and sentencing outcomes. Now, the way that I read that is, let's look at those high discretion, high impact decision points that happen from the time of the initial stop, police stop, all the way through to the time when um, an individual is no longer in state custody, whether that's at the end of the police stop or whether that's uh, when they're when DOC um, is releasing them. Um, uh, some of the data points are uh, spelled out in the legislation. You know, they're looking at plea agreements, sentence, type, sentence types and length, criminal history, offense severity. But then they all the legislature also asks us to think about any other metric that may further explain or help elucidate why our incarcerated population um, of minorities exceeds their kind of demographic representation in the state. Um, the legislation asks us further um, to just look at the current data systems and see and find where they're insufficient um, or where they where we need additional analysis. And then very importantly for me um, is what staffing and resources are needed to support a more robust reporting. So that was the initial charge. And then throughout the course of debate on this bill, um, you know, it seemed like, well, okay, we're going to do this analysis and figure out what data we have and what data we need in order to kind of help explain some of these disparities that we're seeing. Um, but what if we see something very obvious right off the bat where we could make a recommendation outright. Um, why do we have to wait for us to come back with this report? And then why do we have to wait for um, uh, the legislature to act? You know, it could be two years before, you know, something that might be obvious to us at this first blush um, gets acted upon. So then they, the legislature added a, a subsequent section that said, perform an initial analysis of sentencing patterns across the state 
to identify where the use and length of incarceration might result in or exacerbate racial disparities and make any related proposals for legislative action. So, um, and then what's gonna happen from there, uh, I didn't include this, but if, you, if anyone wants to just, you know, do a deeper dive in Act 148, um, we need to present the, our findings and our recommendations by December 1st um, to both the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, which is a committee made up of members of, from the House and the Senate. Um, it's mostly the leadership from the House uh, or from the Judiciary Committees and the Corrections and Institutions Committees with other folks mixed in. Um, we need to make recommendations to, to them by December 1st, but we also have to make recommendations to the Sentencing Commission, which again, a lot of members of this committee are participants in that as well, um, for them to look at uh, immediate changes in sentencing structures that might be uh, exa exacerbating racial disparities. So it's a complicated project. And honestly, um, we don't have a lot of time. I hate to say December 1st, you know, if you think about it, what do we have? You know, just a handful of meetings between now and then, three meetings. And the way that I see it is, you know, we might need to call in some experts uh, on how to do this right, especially with respect to that resourcing issue. Um, and, you know, I think that I would just, if I could just say, there is already a, as we all know, there is already a data uh, requirement, a data collection requirement uh, for our law enforcement agencies and the fair and impartial policing sections of the statutes. And I think, you know, if we can recall back to Professor Seguino's report um, to us um, when she came into our council, there, there are some deficiencies in that process. And it's been around for a couple of years now that we want to make sure that we learn from those mistakes and get this right, because um, you just run the risk of running of of making incomplete uh, you having incomplete information, and we just need to you know what I have been telling the legislature from you know committee to committee is you know we need to have a consistent high quality data collection where one where we're coding things, you know, state's attorneys are coding the same things the same way that the police are and the, and that the state and DOC is coding things the same way that uh, the state's attorneys are and the courts are doing the same thing. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to draw conclusions and track, uh, you know, a single case as it's from the starting point to the ending point, um, unless these agencies are all able to kind of integrate their data with one another. So with that, I, I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions on this piece of legislation specifically, but um, I think that, you know, given our tight turnaround, this Section 19 requires some conversation from this group. Thanks, Pepper. Um, um, this is Robin. Can I address some of the, the um, data questions, or do you want me to wait? Give me one second. I, I I might wear well right now, but I know that Monica was thinking of something and I wanted to give her a moment in case she had raised her hand. And I just want to see if Monica is, do you still have something you want to bring up or did you? Well, I was listening to Pepper give the overview of, of the bill and um Mostly what the thing I wanted to mention is not related to the report, but um, he did mention a $2 million appropriation uh, that came with this bill. But in fact, that appropriation has not um, been added um, to S338. And so right. I, I understand and I know there are some uh, <clears throat> legislators on the call um, that there was an intention to try and find that. But at this point, there is no implementation money for the all the other aspects of Act 148. Can I ask a question of you? What, so. All, there, always. <laughs> okay. So that was in there, was actually the very specific funding request. And as the act now exists, it's, it's not, correct? The act that was, yes, passed and signed by the governor does not have that appropriation right. in there. Sounds like first recommendation to me, but okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Robin, you wanted yeah. to please. Sure. Um, so I guess a few things. Uh, one, I sent out to Aton, and I had po we had posted it in that data summit meeting. Um, a list of what's a data request and what's a research question. This actually came out of your panel when I was there last time explaining internet security agreements and all the stuff that we have to go through to do research. Um, and this was just a kind of handy guide of what, what are public data, what can you download now, what can we look at, and how can we, how can we do this. Um, and so to answer some of the questions, or at least um, also into kind of why we're in this bill um, as CRG, is because we actually have already received funding to do some of this work and have started the process on the, on the security agreements and the data sharing agreements to get at some of these questions. Um, the Bureau of Justice Statistics has awarded us through DPS um, several research projects uh, that address the issue of race and disparities. One in particular has been underway for a year and was scheduled to be kind of complete before the pandemic hit. Um, and that is uh, DOC. Uh, we have an agreement with them. They gave us data on uh, everyone who was incarcerated at a point in time, including their uh, risk assessment scores, age of um, the age that they came in as, marital status, uh, age of highest education obtained, et cetera. Then what I did is I pulled their criminal histories from Vermont, because we have a research agreement with VCIC to do that. But what we know from further research um, is that those out-of-state criminal histories are a problem. Um, they're used a lot in our system and impact sentences, so I need to access those uh, in order to really get at the root of the problem. And we have begun that process uh, with the FBI. We have what's called IRB approval. The FBI IRB has approved my research design and my security agreements. We're now waiting for NLETS, which is the national. Um, so for you guys that see criminal histories on a daily basis, what happens is, is a computer pings all 50 states and comes back with this jumble of stuff that you get. Um, we have an agreement, we're working with NLETS to get all of that electronically, uh, which would be nice. The last time they sent me data, it was 10,000 actual pages of criminal histories that I had to black out and get college students to code, et cetera. Um, but we have an electronic process in, in place to do this, and then we have hired, um, uh, we've, we've taken some of the money that the feds have given us to um, pay a uh, an organization to create the, the scripts in R, which is open source, and so anyone will be able to do this afterwards to code all those criminal histories. Um, like I said, this was, this was already in process, which is one of the reasons why we're there, because we're able to answer all, a lot of these questions with that data. Um, but because of the pandemic, we're behind on that one. The other thing I wanted to address was the NIBRS data, which um, has been in use for 30 some odd years in Vermont is audited, has some problems, but it's better than the traffic stop and race data. From that data, I have the incident number, and I can track that incident number into the court data that we get directly from the courts. I can also then get the docket number and track that into DOC data. So we have an ability to actually track people across the system. It's not elegant, it's not instant, but it can be done. So I do want to say that there are some data points that are available uh, right now and that you can, that we, that we will be uh, beginning that work on. There are some data points that we haven't worked with. So at the Sentencing Commission, I was asked about plea bargaining. And the answer is I'd have to pull a lot of paper files, read all of the narratives, come up with a coding scheme, uh, was the victim cooperative, for example, um, all the myriad of things that go into a charging decision and then you know, analyze the data that way. What I do have access to is what the original charge was and what the final charge was um, and what the uh, sentence was. So we can do some things by proxy, but the deep dives um, do take a lot, of, a lot of work. So that's just a quick primer on the data. Does anyone have any questions on that? I know that Gary Scott has his hand up. I'm not sure. Gary? Yep. I, I, uh, I, I guess I wanted to piggyback off what uh, Pepper was saying about the rollout of data and traffic stop data. And, you know, Stephanie's on the line and Robin's on here. And I think they could also just say that the inconsistencies of the starting of the reporting of all this data, I think very clearly leads back to we never funded properly 
how to train law enforcement to consistently put this data in correctly. And we yeah. still see those problems today. And that's yep. 2014 to tw from 2010 to 2009 to mm -hmm. the start of this process with the Uncommon Alliance of how we actually captured traffic stop data all the way till today with the state police is we're still having station commanders fix data that is being entered in by the road trooper and still a huge amount of uh, of inconsistency and uncertainty of how to actually put this all in and and we've also get more and more requests about what we want from a traffic stop and the, i think really the, the upfront part of anywhere where we go with this data, there has to be a significant amount of time and effort put into people capturing it correctly so we can understand really what we want and what we want to get out of this data. And that has just been, the ball on that has been dropped so badly when it comes to traffic stop data that it, it, it's unfortunate, it's difficult to deal with, and it paints a picture that is not accurate when you're looking at it in a lot of different ways. And I just, I guess I hopefully would just reiterate the fact that, that Pepper said is that we really want to make sure we're doing this right from the start and learn from our mistakes. Okay. Thank you. Robin, I have a question that I, I think you and, and possibly Professor Seguino could weigh in on here, not to put you on spot, but, um, it sounds to me as though, first of all, we're, that the deeper dive is necessary. I mean, I could certainly say that from my involvement with the traffic stop data, that it was a mess, frankly, when it first started. Um, if that's in fact the case, and I, I mean, I was listening to you, I hope carefully, it sounds like you don't even have the resources to do that dive. Is that correct? <laughs> oh, that's and a tricky it's, question. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, here's what I do have funding for uh, through BJS, and that's one of the reasons why you know we're here is that uh, we've been listening to for a long time and trying to get a grasp on um, what is driving these uh, these disparities, especially in the facilities. So um, here's what we have funding for. One is that big study that I just told you about about just let's track back to the circumstances of the offense to the prior criminal histories. Let me do some math, because as I have said in this body before, um, I'm not entirely um, convinced that the, um, that the use of criminal histories, especially coming out of police departments and areas where we know that there's been blatant racism, um, we're still using those criminal histories in our criminal justice system here, and I'm not sure that's that's appropriate, but at least want to document that and let you all decide that. Um, so to do the qualitative study, to really get in on the plea bargainings, no, we don't have funding for that. Um, we do have funding on another project that will be a part of this that is about um, the alternative programs. And this came out of a discussion with the um, uh, Vermont uh, Commission on Human Rights, Curtis is the federal the federal baby. Um, and we were having this really great discussion and knowing what I know about the data for all our, uh, our alternative programs like treatment courts and so on, those programs that divert people from the criminal justice system may not be serving people of color at the rate that they could be. And so that compounds the problem. Um, and so we have a grant that's looking at that right now. Uh, that will be done relatively soon. But here's the kicker. I can tell you that most of the um, community justice centers aren't collecting race data of the people that they serve. So I have to triangulate that through the criminal histories or through other data sources that I have to try to identify the race of the participant. Um, but that one we should have done by the end of the year. Okay. But yeah, no, in order to do uh, the type of data integration that, that I've heard talked about, you need to fund it um, in order to do the, the really good qualitative analysis, which I think needs to be done. That needs to be funded. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a follow up, but anyone else? I have a question, Anton. I, I don't have the option to raise my hand, so I, I have to just <laughs> ask for forgiveness. Um, I have a question for Pepper. 
I know you had mentioned that part of the committee was providing reports to two entities, but if you saw something blatant um, that could be corrected, uh, you would lean towards maybe being able to go to those uh, departments potentially so they could make changes because of the, the length of time it takes to get through the legislative process. Is there is there provisions to to be able to do that if the departments are receptive to uh, those recommendations to make changes or is that frowned upon because they want an overall view of how a recommendation might affect something else? So in other words, they have to look at the totality of the data instead of the departments deciding what's best. I, I, I guess uh, I just want to make sure, A, there's not a, a restriction for you that you only have to provide for these two entities, but B, what are the, um, what are the uh, um, safe, safety nets or safe, safeguards in place to make sure they're following the recommendations that you want uh, based on what you're providing? Does that make sense? I think, I think I understand. Um, and there's certainly uh, the ability of um, executive branch agencies, including corrections and the state's attorneys and defender general's office and whomever else to make corrective actions immediately. They're, they don't, they're, they don't need to wait for legislation unless what they're, the corrective action contravenes some other piece of legislation. Like if, you, if we said that the race data that they're collecting isn't making any sense, they can't just stop collecting it. They have to do that. Um, but uh, but no, there's there's nothing that would prevent an agency if they decided something was a good idea to start doing it right away. Um, the legislature included that second section, um, and it, again, this is my interpretation. Sometimes it's hard to pin down legislative intent, but it was my reflection on their intent that uh, if we saw something that required legislative action, we shouldn't be shy about including it in the report, um, mm -hmm. and the December report. You know, it, originally this was a, a race data collection report without any sort of real recommendations about statutory changing changes. Uh, but if we saw something, we shouldn't be shy about including it. it I think that was the like impetus behind that change. Um, and we do have legislators on the phone uh, or on, on this call that could certainly chime in if they wanted to about what what their intent was in, in including that. Um, but that was my that was my impression. Yeah, for for example, I just wanted to use the uh, fact like when in our committee we talked about um, when it comes to tickets, for instance, that um, it's kind of at the judgment of the trooper to kind of judge uh, what the race of the person is. And we were thinking, could it be put at the bottom of the ticket where the person would fill it out themselves? And that may be great for Vermont State Police, but it might be good for the other agencies to do that too. You know, the local police, the sheriffs, all that. Um, so that that was kind of an example that maybe the state police could make the change, but it would might it might take legislative action to make sure all the departments do it or something like that. That's right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Comments? Questions? I have one for you again, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, thinking out loud, which is always disastrous. Um, would you be, you're doing, I mean, you're the research arm of this entire um, proceeding, correct? Yeah. CRG. Okay. So it feels to me, and I could be wrong, that what might serve you best to do the research is for this body with its sort of far-flung expertise to perhaps make some kind of list of these high impact, high discretion moments to speak with you about them and get some grasp of perhaps what it might take to do that. And when I say that, I'm also speaking about like money Sure. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly, um, and I think, you know, uh, the legislator who just spoke, and I'm sorry, I'm on the phone as well, so I can't see who's speaking, um, brings up a good point. Um, and 
so and one of the one of the things I think that we have to map out that I perhaps haven't mapped out well for you is where the race data in particular comes from and how it gets transferred from one agency to another um, and what gets lost in the transfer process. Uh, and so who is – so, for example, I was looking at a uh, file today out of the new Odyssey system on the uh, court filings that the court is going to. And ethnicity was all blank, and I was expecting that because ethnicity is actually all blank in our criminal histories as well. And it's a data transfer process a, a problem that we have to fix. Um, and so even some of those tiny fixes – um, can be helpful, and I can help map people. I can help map out for people where the data lie and what it does tell you, and what it doesn't tell you. So okay. yes, and Never. then I think from there you can make the decisions on what is worth um, the invest the public investment on. So you could make a document that would actually outline those things for us. Is that yeah. crazy? I mean, no. it sounds like a lot of work. Well, it's all in my head. I mean, someone oh. wants to download my head. That's fine. But, I don't know. Kristen, okay. can you download my head yet? I'll throw it over to Kristen. <laughs> yeah, so, great. I mean, it has to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's all in my head. Um, I, and so I can tell you what the risks are for the various data things, and I can go back and do what I call validation interviews with the people who, like, you know, the NIBRS auditor and, and, and with my connections at the court, and DOC is always so helpful, and I'm being honest. Um, you know, so people really do have a vested interest in getting the, these data to be accurate and out there. Uh, so, yes, I, you know, it's actually pretty – it's not as – yeah, it's that I can do. Okay. Before I charge ahead with my thinking, anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> okay what i'm thinking and I, you know me i'm like action points always um if if that document could come forth sure and then be disseminated and that's me um to the panel that it would seem would be where the next meeting next month has to go is outlining those points that would give us some structure for recommendations because I, I don't know, it's seeming to me that this is all coming back to a question of funding, that if we had a sense of where the looks, the long looks need to be directed, we then not only have a sense of what the what the panel would recommend to the legislature in the at the beginning of December, but also, frankly, how much money it might cost. Is that unreasonable? Eitan, I have uh, just one, and and maybe this is something I could just throw out to the panel. Maybe someone else. Maybe Robin, you know. But, um, you know, in 2019, Connecticut passed uh, SB Senate Bill 880, which became public law uh, 1959, that was a, a, a data collection bill, um, and it had a fiscal note on it. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, it laid out all of the things that people wanted to see collected. And then the prosecutors got together and they came up with a fiscal note and said, you know, it cost X number of dollars. It was their first report was supposed to come out July 1st, but I, I actually just haven't, I called um, one of my, uh, you know, I called the prosecutor in Connecticut and asked him how it was going, but I haven't heard back from him yet. Um, and I'm wondering, maybe Robin, do you know? Um, but that could be a starting point. But Robin, do you know? Yeah, the I haven't of seen the report. Um, I am familiar with Conne uh, Connecticut does great work. Um, yes, so I can certainly reach out to people that I know down there um, on some of the work that they've do done. And one of the things I'm thinking of as I'm hearing um, this is that maybe what I will also do is because I think you know one of the things that goes to that fiscal cost, for example, you know when. I set up an agreement with DOC to get something that's beyond their original data reporting. Con you know, I have to pay for somebody to write that report. Um, I think Pepper, it's going to be the same thing for your uh, for your system. Um, that you've got a bunch of standard reports that you can run, and then if it's something deep, uh, we're going to have to pay your vendor to do it. That that's was right. what I heard the last time I talked to your vendor. I don't know if that's still true. It um, is. It is. 
Okay, so I think we need to start. We need to start um, with those high high discretion points that people are talking about. But I, you know, I also want to point out that structural racism isn't just about the individual discretion points. It's the structure. So we also have to be thinking broader. I think. Um, beyond just those individual discretion points, but really getting at these questions, what, you know, where does the data live, what does it cost to get it out, and what does that look like? So I can start that process if people want to field uh, me questions about different aspects of the system um, that you want answered, I can do that. I, I would just note all, sorry, Eitan, I saw you taking a breath there. No. Um, I would just note also that, you know, the state's attorneys have actively been looking at alternative case management software. And so this is a good time for us to start at the ground level and kind of build the system that we're looking for. Um, and it's one that's fully integrated with the judiciary's new date case management software. So that it's one step in the right direction already. Um, wow, didn't you guys just get your new software? A couple of years ago. <laughs> Okay, well, that was quick. All right. And it's the defender, out of curiosity, since we have defenders on here, is the defender general also thinking of, of moving on from that case management system? I can um, tell you that they've been in the initial conversations just as we have, but it's been very okay. initial. Okay. Good to know. Thank Monica, you. You had a question or a comment or something. A contribution. I had a comment. I had a, yes, a contribution. I like the way that sounds. Um, and some some of us are also on this other um, group, the National Criminal Justice Reform oh, yeah. Project. That's also you know it's run <laughs> Robbins. Oh yeah, <laughs> out of uh, the Department of <laughs> Public Safety. Well, because I feel it's um, Robin and Pepper and you know others of you who are part of that will probably. This conversation sounds familiar to that project as well, which is how do you take criminal justice data from disparate systems and bring it together so that you have a set of data that's going to answer sort of these, you know, really deep, deep questions. And um, I'm just wondering if there's some synergy here, because what, what the Department of Public Safety project or the NCJRP project I think is trying to do, and Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, is thinking about really what is the um, foundational IT structure to put into place. You know, how can you take data from different places and bring it together and store it in a way so that then you can combine data sets? And I think there's an overlap here, but so I just wanted to sort of bring that to <laughs> yeah, into the you conversation. Know, um yeah, so we submitted on that project, just to let people know what it is, uh, part of it is the state integration, part of it is testing the Arnold pre-sentence, um, pre-trial pre assessment uh, tool that predicts whether somebody will uh, failure to appear, commit a new crime, or commit a new crime of violence. Um, it doesn't work for Vermont, so, but we still have to do this other stuff too, which is the data integration. Where we kind of left off, but this was because before Kristen joined, um, so we were in that limbo for a while um, with the data structure. Uh, one of the things that, that we put in our plan um, that was approved by the Department of Public Safety and other people like Monica and other people read into it, um, ADS, uh, certainly the start, and just to give you an example of how a decision can be made that affects everybody's you know, downstream research. So... Um, the judiciary changed the way that they coded probation and split sentences and didn't tell us, didn't tell anyone. Um, and so I go to run a report, and it turns out nobody was sentenced to probation in 2019, which is wrong. Um, but nobody told us that they changed it. And so then when they changed it, we have to go back. VCIC changed some data that they shared, and that didn't work. Um, so getting people to communicate about their systems and what they're changing is also something that we're recommending that you don't, you don't operate in a vacuum. Um, other people use your data, so, yeah. Uh, but now that Kristen's anyone? here, we can talk about that integration. Okay. Anyone else? Comments, questions, this is the time. We're gonna come up with an action plan by the end of this meeting. Okay. Robin, what would you need from this body 
to produce the work that actually synergistically we need to go forward with our work. Sure. Well, if you just, if we're just talking about the, you guys give me questions that you want answered from the data and I tell you what we can and can't do. That may be a good, um, I encourage people to look over that sheet that I did put together of like uh, what's the data request and what's research to get an idea. Um, so that, because it does live inside my head and I do have to get it out someday, that's, that's, that I can get to you by, if people get me questions by the end of next week, I can get it to you by the time you, you're, you meet next. That's okay. It. Can I ask you, Robin, can you get that document back to me because I don't remember getting it. Okay. Yep. I will send that on to you and you can, I mean, and you can share it. That yep. doesn't mean it didn't come. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, it's all right. I, I, okay. Thank you. And then I can get that back to the, to the panel. Um, yep. Pepper, you had some interesting thoughts that you shared with me about how to proceed. Would you be willing to sort of make that more general right now? Because I think we have to, I mean, you've been very clear as is the legislation. We really don't have very much time to do this. You had recommended to me next month that we should have a meeting with our experts. I, I would very much like to start drilling down on okay, we want these data points collected consistently from the moment, of, and I am oversimplifying this because believe me, there are people like some of the people on the call tonight that specialize in this. And I'm coming at it as a lay person who, um, but I think that what we need if we're gonna have a report by December 1st is to start to vote at least some, some portion of next meeting to listening to people that specialize in data systems tell us like, okay, like you wanna collect, you know, every time there's a plea agreement offered or any time that there is a diversion um, referral and what is the outcome of that case long-term, um, you know, that we're gonna need to start hearing from some legitimate experts, including, you know, even my IT director to say, what are the capabilities of our data, what are our case management system? What are the capabilities of the one that we're looking at so that we can start putting some dollars behind um, what we're gonna do and how we're gonna collect it. I mean, I think a lot of the decision points that we're talking about fall on prosecution, um, but there are the kind of the, the law enforcement end and the corrections end um, and the sentencing end the court's perspective um, where we're gonna where we're gonna need some integration I don't know like it's sound it's sounding to me from what I'm hearing that that's a very expensive proposition but um, it sounds like if we really want to track a case uh, from beginning to end that there's gonna have to be some form of integration or some at least consistency in the way that we code things okay it, it's not very helpful I, I like I understand that but like uh, you know my advice would be to start like drilling down on who, who we need to talk to and get them set up for the next meeting um, to really bring in some people that, that think about these things, including CRG, including Stephanie Seguino, including Kristen McClure about how, how would we do this? And including Monica, I saw her hand pop up. Yeah, Monica. <laughs> Only when my hand pops up. Um, <laughs> Pepper, you said something, or I think it was Pepper or Robin, I can't remember, one of you said something that just sort of sparked an idea, because I think one of the um, goals of this work is, as you say, sort of mapping someone from beginning to end, mm -hmm. and I feel like in other projects that I've done that it's been really successful to, to map out the process, map out the decision points, and have that map available, and then at those places where there are decision points, you understand, okay, here's a place where we could actually maybe get some data. That's just the way I think in terms of the way that um, I like to approach things. It might not work for every, everyone else. I'm just thinking about a way to structure a conversation so um, 
it's clear sort of where we are and maybe we need to have some sort of mapping session um a little bit different than what you propose and again it could just be the way i'm i think so if that made sense to people it did yes thank you i guess what we it seems to me not trying to be coercive but that we really need to talk about the next step the problem has been outlined <laughs> repeatedly in some ways but um there's a report now due on, on december 1. i think i personally agree with pepper that we need to we really need to get input from a lot of people on this Robin is going to produce this document that outlines a lot of this. Um, given those, I think we need to sort of come up with a synthesis that gives us an action point. I mean, I'm perfectly fine with setting up a meeting for next month that, in fact, you know, we invite people, but I'd like some feedback from everyone about who that would be. I personally am happy and I've already enlisted him to bring our IT direct our director of IT for all of the state's attorneys who could discuss kind of lift up the hood of our case management system and see what's possible um, from the you know prosecution end. Okay. Monica, is your hand up again? Cause I'm not that sounded awful. I'm sorry. I meant you know what I meant. <laughs> my my hand my hand had um sorry I had not lowered it previously. Oh, okay. so it, it, I, was, it, it was not up, but I can I I will tell you that yes, I mean from I think based on the conversation that we're having, I can represent the department's um, data structure and and bring forward what we can do at the Department of Corrections at that meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jessica. I'm not about to volunteer anyone from the Defender General's office, but I know who to talk to and I can find out where we're at with our case management system. And we definitely like my understanding is that we are transitioning to a new one, but I have no idea where we are in that process. But I can sort of ask these questions around what capabilities we're going to have um, to, to collect this kind of data. Great. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, the good thing about retiring shortly is I'm going to volunteer people that, and I won't be around for it. But uh, Betty will definitely can help with that, and uh, and Kristen yeah. McClure, who's on this call, I think would also be a good resource that could right. uh, step in there as well. Yeah, Eitan, I was thinking. I'm sorry, who was oh. that? Hi, Eitan. This is Kristen. Hi, Kristen. I was thinking maybe a smaller kind of technical meeting with the IT leads from the different areas so we could know what systems are used, but also kind of the data experts to have a data dictionary as well from each area. I think that would be helpful to lay the groundwork on what data do we have in each element and how does it flow upstream and downstream? I'm digesting that, that's all. And, wow. and I would just say that that is actually the first charge of the section 19 report is to yeah. examine what we have right now and uh so i think that's a great recommendation so and i think it'd be helpful if we have the the technical team from all the different areas together having that conversation so we can hear how one system works and how the challenges around that and what another area needs to make sure they're getting the data they need out of that system thank you Jessica, are you, you, Jessica? Yes. I thought, I see your hand up. I thought you wanted to speak. Nope. I don't know how to unraise my hand. Yeah, but you no, it's okay. I, you know, it may be my job. I don't know. All right. Thank you. So, can I, Kristen, can I ask you, given that you're an expert here, would it be more useful to put up a meeting 
with all of the IT people from the various departments. I'm saying I'm not trying to get out of something here, but what I am thinking is there's a level of technical discourse that you need to have that most people, lay people, don't necessarily have and that that might slow you down if you're in that process of basically translating. Would it, is that A, a true and B, if it is, does it make sense to try to put a meeting together with the IT people and you, and then figure out after that some kind of presentation to the panel? Uh, well, I was thinking kind of in the next maybe two weeks or whatever time frame works to have a small working meeting of technical people, so IT and data, to map it out and understand each step in the process and then bring that back to the greater team here in a in a way that can be digested to say right. these are the major elements. By the way, this is how we need to collect it, you know, going forward. Kind of the, I, these are the you know three four key action items as a result of that. Great, I love it. Anybody else? I can I can help facilitate that, Kristen. Uh, uh, just I like you know I know the Defender General's folks and I know. You know, I mean, I, I can just try and help. Excellent, thank you. I think where we're moving on then, if I'm just to encapsulate, is that there's going to be this smaller meeting of people who know what they're talking about. Let me just use that as shorthand. Um, and that then we will look at having them come or a representative to the next RDAP meeting, present us with some proposals. At the same time, we will have this document from Robin, which I will then disseminate and get feedback from everybody on. Does that seem like where we're at at this moment, quarter past seven? I think that's good, Anton. This is Don. I think I would also suggest for the lay people or the people who aren't technical that Maybe a, a, a workflow or a, a flow chart might be handy of each uh, organization they're speaking with so they can see where maybe bottlenecks are or where that could be consolidated or like, like um, I think they're saying one data dictionary may be different than another data dictionary. So anyway, I was it's just a suggestion because more visual. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Anybody else? You know, sorry to keep chiming in. I really feel like I'm talking a lot tonight, but uh, you know, I don't. Other than from the Criminal Justice Training Council, I don't really know if you know the kind of local PDs and the sheriffs. I know like aren't aren't really represented, and they're doing a lot of the data collection that's required. So, um, I mean, I, I just feel like they should be a part of this conversation. Um, and I can I can help with that, Pepper. That's not a problem. There's only it's basically two systems, and Spillman being the major, and then Valcor. Betty has a lot of the ins and outs, and sits on the Valcor committee with uh, Tim Sharlin. So th th that's oh, an easy crossover. Excellent. Okay. Great. That I'm. I don't know that we actually need a motion because it seems to be moving in this direction. Um, Hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to make one anyway. It's in two parts, I guess. One, well, probably even more. The first would be to arrange a meeting that involves CRG. So we would be inviting Robin back because they are the primary research organ for this initiative. Um, certainly Kristen, probably some other presently unidentified um, individuals, all of whom work on data, um, and it'd be to invite them to our next meeting, which will be on the 8th of September. The second would be to work at, and I, I guess that would involve 
everyone who spoke there, it would be Pepper and it would be Jessica and it would be Gary. I'm looking through my list. Certainly Kristen, if she's willing. I seem to be drafting people like I'm important. Um, to come together and put the meeting together in the next two weeks that we've just described. And I'm not going to get more predictive than that. I want to see what comes out of that. I think to be more predictive is also to be prescriptive. And I don't want to do that. I think that's inappropriate. Um, and then to consider the document that Robin very graciously sent to me, and I don't think I have it. <laughs> and, okay. it wasn't yet, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Don't and us. disseminate that again yeah. to get feedback from the panelists. And I'm assuming on that that people will have additions, frankly, about areas that they think are left off. That would be my assumption. So I would put those three things together. Experts at the meeting in September, facilitate this meeting in the next two weeks with the data people, the experts, and three, to disseminate the document that Robin has come up with. Can anyone think of anything else? Great. I don't really want to repeat that. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm going to think that we can all keep that in our heads. And I move that we make that three pronged approach. That took me 10 minutes to outline. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, all in favor, find your little hand and raise it. Okay, thank you. All opposed. Grand, thank you. All abstaining. There it is. Motion is carried. Three prong approach that took me 10 minutes to outline. We will in that be having uh, that on the agenda at the next meeting will be a lot of experts helping us make some clear decisions about these high impact, high discretion points that need to be outlined, um, need to be investigated. Uh, as Robin points out, we also need to look more broadly. I think that's important too. Um, the other thing will be, um, we will, I will certainly talk to Kristen about outlining uh, or setting up this meeting in the next couple of weeks with the experts so that they can sit and talk in a way that is not limited by those of us who don't know. Um, and then ask them to the meeting uh, in September on the 8th. The last point was, yes, and I will get the document from Robin and circulate it to everyone. I feel pretty good about that. Is there anything that we are missing? This is the big question, I guess, that needs to be looked at between now and the 8th of September that that is not that that three pronged approach does not take into account. Okay. That's where we're going. Um, if no one has anything else, that was the main bit of work for this meeting. And I'm really pleased. I think we have a good action plan. Um, and we will work on that. Uh, you've sort of got a sense of, oh, Monica's hand is up. Hold on, Monica. <laughs> it's, not to, it's not to change anything. Pardon? Um, I, I don't know why I'm. Oh, you don't mean to have your hand up. I'm sorry. I, okay. 
No, I, 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 I did mean to have my hand on my hand, on, oh. but I'm hearing myself. I don't know why. All day I've been having, all day I've been having, I'm getting feedback from someone who okay. probably needs to mute themselves. Yeah. Why don't we all mute ourselves so Monica can talk? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not, not urgent. urgent. I can hold it. <laughs> it frustrates me that the technology is keeping you from speaking. Uh, is she using headphones? She should not use the headphones. Monica? Are you using headphones? Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Yep, she's taken them out. She took them out. It's not that. Um, I took them out, but maybe is this better now? Yeah, that yeah, is better. All right. They're in now, so anyway, I apologize. I wanted to share something that I thought was interesting for the panel, just so you know. I think at the last meeting, um, I did talk about the fact that the department was, you know, spending a lot of time um, responding to a lot of data requests and making new reports. And so we we have made um, a new report that we put on our website um, specifically to highlight. Um, race information. So we, we have a population report that talks about the entire population. We took those data points and broke it down by race. And we just um, put the first one up today. Um, and I can put the link to it in the chat for this um, meeting so people can go and get it. What I would want to say is, is, is that it's the start, it's not the end. Um, and um, I'm just looking for people to check it out and, you know, maybe give us some feedback. Great. Thank you. So for those of you who, like me, are technologically impaired, please uh, look at the meeting chat. And I'm sure I'm the only one saying that to myself. Uh, given that we've gone there, I'd like to, I mean, our next item is public commentary. So that means everyone who is not actually a member of the RDAP, um, this is the time to feel free to weigh in on, on what we, of the discussion, to add to it, to detract from it, whatever you need to do. Um, I will do my level best to find who you are. Good Lord. Um, I think there's a show participants or something somewhere here. Um, oh, look, there. And I will um, please speak. Feel free. This is the time. Uh, we hope to limit people to five minutes. Um, but please, please feel free to speak. Or not. So, Etan, this is Martin uh, Lalonde. Um, Hi, please come. Yes, Representative. Yeah. Just very quickly, I really appreciate, uh, I'm delighted that I sat in. Uh, looks like you got a good direction to kick this off and, and I'm really pleased to see uh, where you all are going with this. And I'll look forward to hopefully sitting in on the future meetings as well. And I apologize for that December 1st deadline. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Anyone else? Hey, Tana, Sarah. Yeah. Hi I, Hi, I just want to say I appreciate it. it I'm, I'm really delighted to hear how you are all working together. And um, and I'm, I apologize for those deadlines. Believe it or not, we, we required fewer reports than what was originally proposed in that bill. <laughs> um, 
And I just wanted to say to Monica, I just quickly looked on the link and it's pretty impressive, Monica, what you've done. So um, anyway, just I hope to follow some of the work too with just and, and also happy to be um to be hearing from people if if your things are gone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Others, other people. This is your moment. Um, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to think that we've actually done it. Um, if you, I mean, I know it's hot and everybody's tired. Um, I feel, however, I, I don't think I have anything to add. It seems like we have a good action plan. Um, and if that's in fact true, and nobody else has anything they'd like to say. Uh, I would, this is a moment for new business. If anybody has that, this would be a moment for the panelists to bring that up. Uh, Jeff Jones, you had something you wanted us to consider. You might want to speak to that at this moment. Jeff? Yeah, I, I'll probably write it, but thank you. Um, okay. And I can't, I could not raise my hand because I'm a guest as oh. the chief. And so. I'm sorry. No, well, it's why I'm all right. It took the whole entire meeting to figure out why. There's no reason why I should <laughs> blame you. Uh, uh, I know. I think it's appropriate for me to write my comments. Um, I think everybody's tired. It's 90 okay. degrees, right? So uh, I'll wait. I can write. Okay. Then the last thing I need to say is that the next meeting, as I indicated earlier, is on the 8th of September. Um, we always meet, for those who do not know this, on the second Tuesday of every month from 6 to 8 p.m. When we're in meet space, it's usually somewhere along the I-89 corridor. None of us have to worry about that right now, though. Um, so we will be here in Cyberland on the 8th of September. That's about it. May I have a motion to adjourn if that's where people are at? This is Jessica. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Great. Second. I'll second the motion. Wonderful. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? all abstaining. Go in peace. I will see you all next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Aton. You're welcome. Thank you Bye. all.